it was sort of at the point where it was either click buy on a new laser or figure out a different trajectory. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Jacqueline Kyle of The Fable Tree and talk to her about her business and how she went from starting Glowforge owner to having a course on Adobe Illustrator design for Glowforge makers. It was such an interesting conversation and she has so many great thoughts to share on things that she might have done differently, places she might have wasted her time, places she was really happy with the results. And really, what was that inflection point between continuing to become a bigger and bigger maker or really move into more of this education space? So excited to talk to you today, Jacqueline. Good to be here. Thank you. What is your business currently and how long have you been doing that? My business is The Fable Tree, and it's definitely evolved over the past almost two years now, actually, we've been here. I sell digital files, but the bulk of my uh, business right now focuses on my courses. So I offer two courses. FileMakers Academy is really my big one. You can be a very beginner, have never even opened Adobe Illustrator before, and I just walk you through everything you need to know. Simple. We start off really basic with designs, and then we just work your way up, building on skills until you're a design expert by the end of it. So that's really my, my baby. And then I have the Etsy for file makers, which is sort of the next step for people who want to start listing their files and making money from, from that. From what I know from taking your course, this was not where you intended this business to go. No. <laughs> so will you give everyone kind of a little background on why did you start with a laser in the first place? Did you have a business before? How did it all, how did it all come to be? Yeah. Okay. I'm one of those serial entrepreneurs. So I have started and abandoned a million businesses and I just get really caught up in an idea. And then I'm like, hmm, but what about this other idea? <laughs> So what I really needed was a, d a business that would incorporate all of my loves, right? So teaching and design. I'm an academic. I'm a professor in my day job, but that involves a part of my brain and I need, I need the rest. When I started seeing Glowforge ads and I don't know what I happened to click on to get that in my algorithm, but I'm glad <laughs> I did. Um, it just kept, you know, I, I was on, on fire with ideas. I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many things I could make. I'm just so excited with, and I really intended to make physical pieces and I did. That's how I started designing and making the same thing over and over and over again. Finally, when it got to the point that I really needed to think about, okay, do I need another laser? Where am I going from here? I enrolled in Marie Forleo's B-School, basically an online business school really quick. Uh, so she walks you through everything you need to know. And I, I think the parts that really helped me was this exercise exercise where you go through and you write down everything you love, everything you're passionate about, or whether it seems related to business or not. And then you kind of look at it and see what, what comes of it. And for me, I realized that while I loved my business, I loved designing pieces. I loved making them once and <laughs> seeing how it turned out uh, that I did not love making a hundred bow holder. Bow holders were really my big seller. So uh, I did not make like making 200 bow holders every month or, or however much it was. I like to design new things. And then there was this other little thing that I'd been doing kind of informally, not even as part of my business, mentoring other Glowforge users. So, you know, I had lots of knowledge and I, I'm a teacher, like this is what I do. So teaching other people was something that I was six or eight Stu I, I wouldn't even call them students because it was nothing so formal, but just where, you know, if they had a problem, I was the one that they came to and I would get on Zoom with them and help them get through it, or we would talk it through, or I'd record them a little tutorial. Or So I realized that was really rewarding for me, that mm -hmm. the teaching part and the design part, that's what I was really passionate about. And the creation of the same thing over and over, not really what I was about. So instead of buying a new laser, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, we've got this whole other direction we have to take now. And it just kind of kind of went, went from there. So once I knew that I did not want to, 10 years from now, still be selling physical pieces, it was a pretty quick transition process. How long after you got your Glowforge did it take for you to be profitable? It took me a, a little less than two months to earn back the money I had spent on the Glowforge itself. And I have the Glowforge basic, so a few thousand dollars. Uh, so, And I did not have a business prior to that. This was from scratch, putting all my energy in the wrong areas, <laughs> kind of <laughs> just... Oh, just a disaster early business. And it only took me two months. And so I, I, I'm pretty happy with that. I kind of took off pretty quickly. So how did you approach the early stages of your business? Did you focus on one small thing and do a lot of it and really get it in front of a lot of people? Okay. That's what I recommend people do. Uh, no, <laughs> I want to do everything. I had so many ideas, like I mentioned, and I had designed so many files waiting for my Glowforge to even come. 
And I just wanted to make it all and I wanted to put it all out there and I wanted everybody to love all of it. And I wanted to just spend, spend so long making this beautiful, beautiful website with all of my beautiful, beautiful pieces and just, just such a waste of time. <laughs> just yeah. such a waste. It really was. Um, I just, I don't know what it was. I, I'd been on Etsy long ago in grad school, but for whatever reason, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go Etsy this time. This time I'm going to make it my own. Don't do it. No, that, I would say that's definitely one of my big mistakes is I put a lot of effort into building a beautiful website with all of my beautiful pieces and there was no traffic to it. Right. I mean, I did SEO, but <laughs> most right. of my sales came from Facebook groups and things like that. So no, I was kind of all over the place with what I offered and where I offered it and how I offered it. And it just was kind of a chaotic mess at first until I finally refined my systems down and figured that fi figured out my niche and figured out you know what I wanted to be doing and, and how. How did you go about finding your niche? I have a, a three-year-old and so she was littler at the time of course and I was in a lot of these kid buy sell trade pages where you, people are exchanging gently used clothing and th all that kind of stuff and there was one or two of the groups where I saw people posting their own creations things that they had made themselves and so I started off by saying okay well I make a lot of things that fit with the vibe of this group which is kind kind of like a boho neutral thing. Like they're not about loud colors. They're not about characters. They're here for beige. And I'm a bit, I'm a big fan of beige. I have nothing against beige. So I started by offering this, the items that I thought would fit really well in those groups. And, you know, I would post and get three or four sales here, post, get three or four sales there. And then I made my first bow holder. I posted it thinking I was going to get three or four sales and I got like 45. And um, in these groups, there's a short turnaround time. So you have to ship within a certain amount of time. I panicked. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, 45, how am I going to make 45 bow holders in one week? So that was sort of my introduction to the idea that, okay, if I make things I actually want for my actual child, that's, that's my niche, right? Boho, little kid stuff that you would put in your house and be happy that it's there. I kind of stumbled on it actually. It's not like I thought that bow holder was going to make a ton of sales. It just did. Yeah. And so then I started offering more things kind of along those lines and having a similar response. I was like, okay, I guess this is the intersection of what people want and what I want to make. And at that point, were you on Etsy fully? Yeah, I think at that point, those were via Facebook groups. And I, I, I had at that point admitted to myself, okay, maybe, maybe my website's not as good a sales vehicle as I was hoping. But my big push to get on Etsy was selling files. So I would share my projects in the Glowforge groups just saying, hey, look what I made, or oh, look, this paid my mortgage and I didn't expect it to this month. And um, just kind of sharing and people would say, hey, where can I get that file? And what I noticed is that everybody was saying, what's your Etsy? What's your Etsy? What's your Etsy? They wanted the sort of credibility of purchasing a file from an Etsy seller versus send it to me. Yeah. So I was like, and I guess I'll put something on Etsy. So I started on Etsy with my files and then I, I would eventually put bow holders on there and made some good sales on Etsy with those as well. But yeah, actually the push to get on Etsy was the files and, and I did have them both in the same shop with no issue, but I know some people do struggle with that. So when you were developing your Illustrator course, Mm -hmm. Had you taken a ton of Illustrator courses? The way that I learned is that I pieced it together from a million tutorials and, you know, I dove deep into the Illustrator resources that they provide. And just, uh, in fact, the, the whole month that I waited for my Glowforge to arrive, I designed files. I had no idea if they were going to work. Let me be clear. <laughs> I pieced it together from the Glowforge forums and from the Facebook groups and from tutorials I had seen. And I said, okay, this is what is this, this should work. And I made dozens of files and I was so scared that it was going to be a giant waste of time <laughs> because, you know, if you don't have a Glowforge to test it, you're just kind of hoping for the best. I, you know, by the time that um, my Glowforge came and I tested my first file and I was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> And so by the time that I got to the point of the Illustrator course, I had learned enough to know that there are a million ways to do anything in Illustrator. Yep. If I show somebody a technique and somebody else comes along and says, oh, well, why'd you do it that way? I do it. This, who cares? Great. Do it that way. If it works for you, fantastic. The point is to make beautiful files that work every time. I knew that, okay, I haven't had formal training in Illustrator, but I've had practical training. Yep. I, I've figured it out myself. I've, I've, I've pieced it all together. And if there's something I don't know, I can figure out how to do it. I didn't really have imposter syndrome in that sense. It was more just, oh, I'm kind of new here. Does anybody care to learn from somebody who is this new here? And you know, it's, I, I had been at my business for, I guess, less than a year at that point. So oh, it's not like I was an established Glowforge guru. I know that I'm good at teaching and I know that I have knowledge and we just had to go for it. When you started thinking about doing your course, mm -hmm. what were the things that you were most excited about? What were the things you were most intimidated about? Ooh, with the course. Well, I was nervous that I would go through all this work making this course that I knew would be great and valuable and nobody would 
buy it. <laughs> of course, I mean, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff you need, a lot of software you need, a lot of things you have to pay for, a lot of copywriting you have to do, a lot of stuff before you even get into the course content itself. Not to mention lighting and recording and microphones and all these things. And I was like, oh goodness, what if I do all of this? and nobody needs it, nobody wants it. They just all wanna piece it together like I did. So that was the intimidating part. I think the exciting part, I would say the first live webinar that I did. So when I launched FileMakers Academy, I launched live. So I held webinars that were just like this, you and you and me and 30 people. And the energy on the first live webinar was just, incredible. I love being in front of a classroom and having my student, I mean, I teach anthropology uh, in person. And so love seeing my students light up and all that. And I felt it with the, with the first live webinar. I had students who were so excited about it. They were like, let's go. And I might've only made, I think I only made a few sales from that first live webinar, but it was kind of this validation that, yeah, people want this. And they respond to my teaching style. Yes. Like, my, this might work. I responded to an ad. I knew you were selling something that was going to be really easy to follow and was going to get me from point A to point Z without taking 7,000 years. That's really my point is that, yeah. yeah, everybody can figure this out by themselves, but how much time are you going to waste taking point A to point B to point, wait, why are you at S and come back and... Yeah. Just having to hold your hand and walk you through it, that's valuable. With starting your business originally, what advice yeah. did you follow that you wish you hadn't? Yeah, I think I spread myself too thin on social media. So I knew everybody says, you have to be on social, you have to be on social or nobody will buy your things. Nobody will know you. Nobody will have that no like, and trust factor. And so I was like, okay, let's start a Pinterest page. Oh, and a Facebook. Oh, and an Instagram. And let's do it all. And y'all, I'm not... I'm not meant for that. <laughs> um, I could either do that or I could run a business. I can't do both. Right. So I, I, at this point, I, I pretty much just do Instagram and even that I'm not super consistent with. So I, I think I just spent way too much time organizing content calendars and templates and for three different platforms. And I, I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend start with one, really nail it. <laughs> and then if you've got bandwidth left over, maybe expand to another one. And then on your website, would you have started just with Etsy? I would definitely have still had a website. One of the things that I started early with my website that I, I am glad I did is blog posts. My website now hosts my blog posts and it hosts my, my sort of info pages about my course. It also has the my resources vault where, you know, it's full of free files and that's kind of my email capture there. Yes, I definitely would have had any a, a website, but I would not have had a cart. I would not have had any products there. It would have just been kind of a home base for the Fable Tree and like, this is where you can find everything, including links to Etsy and Instagram and YouTube and all of that. So were you a crafter before you started your Glowforge? <laughs> yeah, back in grad school 10 years ago, oh gosh, longer than that at this point. Um, I had another Etsy shop, two, three other Etsy shops. Yeah, I've always been crafty. I've loved to, and that's, you know, I do that with my kid all the time. We, we love art. So anything creative is, is, it's always good. What is your favorite thing to do in your business? Okay, actually, this is a surprising one. Or, okay. or I was, but my favorite is actually when I have these little one on one calls with a student who might be stuck on a project. And they're like, All right, Jack, I get it. I've watched the video, but I want to do this other little tweak. And I'm like, Okay, let's do it. So I'll get on a call and we walk through it. And I just love having that. It's not face to face, but it's face to face interacting with my students and also seeing when they are excited when it works the best. So I actually, I was, I was thinking that I might need to add coaching calls to my business just because I love to be doing this, to be walking somebody through a project personally. And what is your least favorite thing? Prepping files for sale is <laughs> the worst. I hate it. I have so many files on, <laughs> files on my computer that are designed. They've been tested. They're assembled, photographed, beautiful. I don't want to do it. I just don't want to. I don't want to do it. I don't like to write the instructions. I even, I have a template. It's so easy. It's not hard. I just don't like it. <laughs> so have a marathon where I just slam Red Bull and just list a hundred files because they're all there. They're beautiful. People will want them. I don't want to, I don't want to list them. <laughs> That's probably the only thing that irritates me about my business. How have you found balance with, as you said, you're newer to this world and you want to grow the course and you want to grow that offering. Being a mom, do you feel yeah. that you're balanced? I think I am now. Yeah. So I have uh, a wonderful uh, sitter who comes to take care of my kid for 16 hours a week. And in that 16 hours a week, I have time to work on my business and I have time to work on my professor job. Most of my classes are online uh, with that right now. Outside of those 16 hours, I respond to emails, but that's, that's it. I found that I cannot be an effective, joyful parent 
and also be working on stuff when my kid is right there. I got a lot of agitation uh, until I finally realized, all right, we need to set some boundaries here. Some, some sort of, these are work hours and these are not work hours. Mm -hmm. So that's been really instrumental, I think, in finding balance. And of course, you know, there are times that I'm caught up in a project when babysitter hours end and I'm like, oh, I want to keep working. Or there are times when I'm really having a great time with my kid and I'm like, ah, I'm not ready to start working. But overall, I think it works pretty well. Yeah. When you started the business, did you have revenue goals that you wanted to achieve? I just hoped it would make some money. <laughs> like I just hoped that it would be um, not a failure. I didn't have actual revenue goals at that point. Do you wish you had? Would it have changed anything in how you approached it? But I'm wondering if it would have put too much pressure. Um, because again, I, a serial entrepreneur here, there are so many businesses that I've started and then gotten discouraged or uninterested for whatever reason. And I think if I'd said, oh, I want to be making $5,000 a month right now and I wasn't, I'm not sure if that would have put too much pressure on it. So I think I needed at first to just prove to myself that this was a viable business idea. And then once I proved that, now I now I do have revenue goals and I do have things that I'm aiming for and feels a lot more realistic now. For, for people who are just starting out with a Glowforge and say they've come from a cricket or they've or they're just diving in, what order would you say they should do things in? I, I would say that it's a good idea to have an idea of your niche. And then you just have to be flexible and understand that, you know, it might need some adjustment, some fine tuning, that's fine. Um, but you want to have some sort of an idea of what's your thing going to be. Um, so many people want to get out there. I was the same way and just do everything, be everything to everybody, but that's not, it's not effective. You can't, you can't dial in your messaging that way. So it's really good to have some idea, even if it's broad and you dial it in later, but um, I'm going to make kids products. I'm going to make farmhouse home decor. I'm, you need some, some idea of what you're going to do. And then I have to say, you need to invest in the things it will take to be a success. If this sounds like trite advice, but believe in yourself, believe in yourself, but put it in action, right? So that means buy good materials. Don't waste your time buying this $2 a board crap. That's not going to cut through and it's going to frustrate yeah. you end up wasting $8 a board because they won't cut and just find a good supplier, pay what they ask, love them for their good service, right? Yeah. Invest in the softwares that you need to be successful, invest, pay Etsy's fees without complaint because they are, they're a traffic godsend. If you need training, pay for it. So, and I think this is one of those things where, you know, people spend thousands of dollars on a Glowforge and then they are nervous about that, understandably so. And they're like, oh, now I need to penny pinch. Yeah. No, yeah. you need to invest to make sure that that $6,000 thing you bought isn't a paperweight, yeah. right? So for me, I think that's that's one thing that I've seen my my mentees over and over again be, get freaked out about is spending money. And I get it. I do get it. Let me be clear, especially if your business isn't profitable or you don't, you're not coming in with an established business or you don't think you have good business sense or what have you. I get the fear. And also it's one of those things that's gonna keep you from being successful. Right. I would say to make sure that you have everything you need to be successful, whether again, whether it's trainings, whether it's products, materials, 3M seems to be a big, <laughs> a big people don't wanna pay the money and I get it because it's a lot and worth it, yes. right? So buy the things that you need in order to be successful and then follow through, it's a lot. Would you say one of the things that you can help with that, with that fear is because you said, this is kind of the niche where I think I wanna be, you can dial in, okay, but I'm only going to invest as much in these three kinds of products, whether that's black, white, and pink acrylic, or it's three colors of wood or whatever that is. Let me be, be clear. I am saying this partly because I wasted a lot of time on Baltic birch and I just don't, I don't recommend it. So yeah. I, yeah, I don't have a huge stash of thousands of pieces of different kinds of, of material. No, I know what my, my niche likes and I know what I like. And so I have three types of wood. I keep three types of wood on hand in one thickness. And then I do branch out a bit on the acrylic. You know, I have an acrylic subscription box here and I have a, two suppliers that I really love and I just order whatever I like from them. So I do have more acrylic, but for a while there, I was, I'd really niched down and was doing um, white oak bow holders with rose gold mirrored acrylic. Two materials. You can do a whole, a whole business on two materials if you need to. Quality ones though. How do you find inspiration for your files? 
I have a whole phone full of disorganized screenshots of things that I thought were cool. And so uh, usually there's one specific thing about it or it sparks a particular idea. And so I screenshot it and don't take any notes on it and hope that I remember the inspiration <laughs> later. And it's not the best system at all. <laughs> Occasionally I can scroll back through if I'm trying to think of, okay, what's my next tutorial going to be? Because I do usually put out a weekly tutorial uh, just on my YouTube channel. And if I'm, I struggle to come up with projects for these sometimes. So I can scroll back through and I sometimes remember, oh, this is what I wanted to do based on this and go from there. So I think it's sometimes it's a need that I have or a want that I have. So I want a nature scavenger hunt for my kid because she's going to think that's awesome. So I make one. Other times it's uh, a customer has requested something specific and I can I can accommodate that or but on, honestly, a lot of it's just screenshotting things that I think are pretty. For people who are starting out, what would you say is a good way for them to know that they're successful along the way? Like this is a good milestone to aim toward. Like put those in your back pocket metrics or ideas. Absolutely. I would say when you get your first 10 listings on Etsy, that's a big a big deal because Etsy, you know, once you have 10 listings, they will put you out there to more people. So that's that's a big milestone and if you can get a fully filled out Etsy shop and 10 listings, that's a, a good first milestone and controllable one, right? So many of these things of, oh, you've hit a hundred sales or what have you, you can't, you don't have much control over that. Right. You have control over what you put in. So that's the first, the first big milestone I would say is, is this 10, 10 listings and a fully filled out shop. After that, of course, your first sale is going to be big. One thing I love that Etsy does is, is it tells you your sales. Like it says, Oh, congrats. You've got 3,500 sales or, Oh, yay. Another reviews. Reviews are huge. And I especially love it when people include a photo of their project in a review. And I, I cherish those. I love it when, when people do that. So that's a good one. But you know, I think it's, it's more a matter of identifying the metrics and the milestones that matter to you. Maybe to me, the first sale is a really big deal, but to them it's, Oh, is it a fluke? Right. Um, right. But they'll really believe it if it's, so it's, it's partly just defining what success looks like for yourself. And it's fine that if it's different than what success looks like to me, to me, success anymore is not selling a hundred bow holders, um, because then I have to make a hundred bow holders. <laughs> I don't want to. So I think it's important to be reflective and even sit down and do that little exercise of what do you want your business to look like? What yeah. would your dream job look like and make it happen? And anything that you can mark off along the way is, is a good success. Do you think that there is enough room within this laser space? Cause people are starting to make saturated commentary and all of these things. Do you think there's enough room in this space for people to continue to grow and build a business that works for them? Yes. And I think a lot of this is mindset, right? So there's the scarcity versus the abundance mentality. And uh, that can be a little bit tricky if you're, especially if you're operating out of fear or maybe your partner isn't supportive and says, well, you're just going to waste money on this thing and it's going to sit there. I mean, it can be really challenging to come in and say, no, actually there's, there's room for all of us. But I really do believe that there's room for all of us. There are people doing very similar things to what I am doing and we're both thriving and it's wonderful. And so I don't tend to get worried when another chain store starts selling glow forges and I see the panic on the, the Facebook groups and things like that, but it's just, there are going to be the people who make the move and take the action and do it. And there are going to be the people who give themselves reasons to not do it. But I absolutely think that there's room for all of us. Think about the different styles that you see. If you scroll Etsy, if you just type in laser file and you scroll Etsy, you'll see a million different things. And I don't like all of it. And that's fine. I like my little corner of a, a corner of it. And so there are people with all kinds of taste and there's room for people. You know, we've talked about the good parts, the exciting days, yeah. the inspiring days, but um, I think it's good, a good idea to talk about the frustrating, discouraging times as well, because you're going to face it in business. And especially for those just starting out, especially if you pour your heart and soul and you post things and you get crickets because it happens to all of us, I'm sure. It can be really discouraging. I've had discouraging moments in my business and seasons in my business. And for me personally, I struggle with during time, seasons of mourning or grieving. And I just, I, I mentioned to you before we started recording that my stepmother just passed. And, and when, when I'm grieving, it feels like I cannot find joy in the work for a bit. And I'm always scared I'm going to get stuck in that part. Like I'm always scared that the joy won't come back, that I'm done, that this is just it. And that's not the case. It does come back. Um, if you get a bad review or somebody's mad at you because they didn't read your listing, or um, I, I feel like for those of us who are more sensitive souls or more perfectionist types of people, that can really kind of hit you in the gut. And it can feel like, oh, I'm a failure all of a sudden, but you're not. It's one customer. And often that has to do with more with what's going on in their own life. I encourage people to pay attention. Okay, is there truth here? Did I do something wrong? 
If not, all right, move on. If so, see what you can fix and improve. Maybe there was something that was unclear. So kind of take take a minute to sit with it and un- kind of sit with the disappointment or sit with the discouragement or whatever, but don't live there um, because the joy of the work does come back, whether it's something in your personal life or something in your business that's not going how you want it to. I think that it's just important to know that the joy does come back. It's just sometimes, sometimes business is hard. Where can everyone find you, Jacqueline? Oh, okay. You can find me at thefabletree.com. You can also find me on Instagram at thefabletree. And um, if you sign up for my email list, you'll get a weekly tutorial, which is on my YouTube page, also called The Fable Tree. And so that's that's where I am. And where's your favorite place to interact with people? Love the interaction. They're kind of more real-time interaction on Instagram. Okay. Well, that's where people can talk to me and I'll talk back. I, I comment back when people comment and I, it, when, when I get DMs, I always respond. And even if you're just replying to a poll or a survey or something that I asked, um, I, I often reply to those. If you've loved listening to Jacqueline as much as I love hearing her teach, you're going to want to check out her course, FileMakers Academy, which you can find the links for in the description below. Additionally, she's offering with the code that you'll find there, $50 off of her signature course, FileMakers Academy. Stay tuned for more awesome conversations with amazing creators.